Hey everybody, good morning. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit today about how carbon markets work, and in particular the role that data plays in uh, giving value to these underlying digital assets. Um, carbon credits are sort of a unique real world asset in that they are digital native. There's no physical off chain commodity like gold or something that needs to be held in a vault or a you know stock certificate that needs to be held by a custodian. Um, they are digitally native. But the issue is that they're issued in these pretty antiquated SQL databases, and you end up having to pull uh, data from different sources together in order to build a, a market infrastructure for these assets. I'm, I'm going to give a little overview of how that works, and then we'll talk a little bit about the role of decentralized storage in these systems. So this is a simplified market structure for how the carbon markets work. Uh, on one hand, on the bottom left-hand corner, you have the carbon credit registries. These are the issuers of the underlying assets. Uh, you may have heard of names like Vera or Gold Standard if you're in the space. Um, and they really do a few key things. One is that they issue the underlying credits to uh, project developers who register with them through a, a paperwork process, basically. And they also provide a list of approved VVBs or validation and verification bodies who are responsible for auditing the projects, collecting data about what the projects have done, and then reporting that data back to the registry so that they can uh, issue the credits once all the verification has been completed. And then finally, you have buyers who are the ones you know, providing money into the system. They want to support climate action, and they have cash. The most important thing I want to home in on here is the flow of data is really um, the key underlying activity here. Uh, VVBs are collecting data, reporting it. Uh, project developers rely on that data collection process to give value to the work that they're doing. And buyers expect to see lots of data about the projects that they're buying from so that they can assess whether the project uh, is right for them. So we're currently experiencing a Cambrian explosion of environmental assets. On one hand, there are many different kinds of carbon credits ranging from energy efficiency, blue carbon, forest conservation. And then there are a bunch of new credit classes being created too outside of the carbon market. Uh, in particular, there are efforts to create land stewardship credits, uh, as well as renewable energy certificates. And plastic credits are quite new, but uh, picking up some steam. And so there's a situation going on where there's a proliferation of different credit types, and it's going to become uh, it's becoming quite difficult for buyers to navigate this space, especially because typically historically buyers have relied a lot on reputation of project developers, reputation of the registries to guide their purchasing decisions. But as the number of registries increases and the diversity of credits increase, um, it becomes harder and harder to navigate this this quite complex space. And so the catchphrase for this, what's going on right now in the environmental asset market is beyond just carbon. Many people are skeptical about carbon credits in particular. Um, I personally think that carbon credits have a really important role to play, but there's a lot of problems to solve there. Uh, and in particular, as we move beyond just carbon, as we start incorporating uh, other aspects of the, uh, of the climate crisis and the environmental impact into these credit-based markets, um, there's a lot of work to do creating structure and standards for how you think about and classify these credits. In particular, there are a couple of existing impact frameworks that you may have encountered before. Um, on one hand, we have planetary boundaries in the top left hand. Um, this is the idea that there are different planetary boundaries, and uh, we can measure the extent to which we are within those boundaries or exceeding those boundaries, and that gives us a guide for how to target environmental impact. Um, on the other hand, there's sustainable development goals, which are put out by the UN, I think in 2016, they were developed. And even though they're really important, and they provide a really comprehensive guide to how you have positive impact and, and drive towards sustainable development, there are 17 of them. And I don't know about you guys, but I have a lot of trouble keeping track of 17 different SDGs. Um, so there's a balance to be struck between a sort of uh, carbon myopia on one hand, and um, the credit zoo, as I like to call it, where every credit is unique and beautiful snowflake, and nobody really knows what makes one credit like another. And there's a balance to be struck here where we can create uh, enough structure that buyers have some guidance, have some framework for decision making when they're purchasing these environmental credits. Uh, but on the other hand, um, doesn't lead to a massive overwhelm uh, with you know thousands of different credit types that are impossible to compare to each other. And data plays a really important role in structuring uh, this trade off between standardization on one hand and innovative new credit types on the other. In particular, I've been working with a group called Ecological Benefits Framework, and we're developing a, a framework for assessing ecological benefit um, along six different dimensions, air, water, soil, carbon, um, biodiversity, and equity. And we think that these six dimensions are comprehensive enough that they cover all the major classes that buyers are going to be interested in, uh, but also flexible enough that you can uh, fit many different project types under, these, uh, under this umbrella. And six is also a nice number. I mean, maybe it'll be seven. Right now it's six, but it's enough that humans can keep that in their working memory, I can rattle them off quickly. Um, and so as a buyer, it gives me a lot more structure um, as compared to like the SDGs, for instance. But even with these frameworks, there is an inherent trade-off between liquidity and fungibility. Uh, so on one hand, you might have something like a piece of fine art, you know, a, a Van Gogh painting, which is a one of one, it's unique, um, and people tend to pay a lot of money for them, but they're also quite illiquid. 
Uh, meaning that if you have a Van Gogh painting and you want to liquidate it for cash, it might take you six months or a year to go through an auction process and get, um, get cash for that asset. On the other hand, you have highly liquid commoditized assets like fiat currency, dollars or euros, um, or something like a, a agricultural commodity like corn. These trade on highly liquid marketplaces, but they're also very homogeneous, right? A, a bushel of corn is a bushel of corn. And somewhere in the middle, you have assets like carbon credits, which have unique properties uh, defined by the data that defines the underlying uh, the underlying project, but they are fungible with each other in theory, uh, at least if they're from a similar methodology or a similar vintage. And so I want to share a little bit about how those different data points determine the value of a credit. So an analogy here that I think is helpful is thinking about uh, another type of asset that has a certain level of fungibility, but also uniqueness underlying that fungibility. Um, so if you went into a, a shop or a market and you said, I would like a piece of fruit, they could give you anything from a kiwi to a strawberry to a tomato. Those are all technically fruit. Um, but you might have a more specific request. You might be looking for a piece of red fruit, which would narrow it down to just watermelon, strawberries, and tomatoes. But maybe you don't really want a tomato. Tomatoes are usually not thought of as fruit, even though technically they are. So you need to specify, I'd like some sweet red fruit. And the more specific you get with this query, with this request, the fewer options there are for the seller to provide you with. By analogy, in the carbon markets, if you just say, I want to retire some carbon credits, you could end up with one of many different types of carbon uh, from different methodologies, different projects, different countries. Uh, but you could be more specific in your request. And the more specific you get, the fewer carbon credits there are going to be that fulfill that query. And so this is really like a data querying question. And the issue is that the market does not necessarily have the inventory for the query that you're looking for. And so there is a fundamental trade-off between the amount of liquidity available for a given query, a given asset request, and, uh, and the fungibility of those things. The more precise you are in your query, uh, the fewer options there are going to be, and therefore the less liquidity there's going to be. So there's an inherent trade-off here we need, to, we need to strike a balance. So just as an example of the kind of uh, attributes that we're dealing with in this, uh, with this data, um, this is a screenshot from the Vera registry, one of the leading carbon credit registries, and you can see some information here. Uh, in particular, I want to point out um, the uh, the methodology there in the um, second column. Um, so that's the type of activity that's being carried out. This might be planting trees, installing solar panels, what have you. And the methodology is one of the strongest predictors of the underlying value of the asset because the methodology defines the cost, right? If you're planting trees, that has one cost structure. If you're installing solar panels, that has a different cost structure. If you're building a DAC plant, that's going to be extremely expensive. And so the methodology will be the primary driver of price. Uh, but then an individual project might be more desirable or less desirable depending on the region, the project developer, et cetera. And so the real point I want to make here is that the value of a credit is derived from the data associated with that credit. Meanwhile, there are many different carbon credit issuers, and they all have different data standards, data schemas, and there's been some attempts to standardize this stuff, um, but we're really barely on top of it, honestly. Uh, this is a thing called the Carbon Credit Rosetta Stone that a friend of mine built, um, Adam from Toucan Protocol. Um, and we've been contributing to this for a couple of years now, but it's still not complete. Um, and yeah, so we, we've really barely gotten our hands around carbon data. Meanwhile, uh, builders like um, one of the organizations I'm working with, CarbonMark, um, they need data today to build the products um, that they're trying to build. This is our marketplace product. Um, you can see in the front a sort of uh, example project of listings. You've got your description, the lat long location, as well as some photographs and other metadata about the project. And in the back, you can see the sort of overview uh, project page where you have a filtering function that allows you to filter by things like category, vintage, and, uh, and methodology, similar to what I was showing you before with the fruit query. And so how do we balance this? We, we need data today, but on the other hand, the data is not standardized. So there are some efforts going on um, to create an open data standard for carbon credits specifically, but also more generally for environmental assets. And the advantages here are that you get verifiability. It's much easier to investigate when there's a standard data format. Uh, transparency in that there's no crawling through PDFs. Um, you can put a lot of that data out in front of the user instead of requiring them to download a PDF and read through 50 pages. Um, and it makes it much easier for marketplaces and other applications to integrate these assets into their, uh, into their functionality because there's a standard data format and you don't have to deal with five different formats from five different registries. So there is a group called the Climate Action Data Trust that is working to solve this problem. Um, this is just an overview of how the system works. You don't need to understand the details. But the point is that there are registries that are providing data into this system. And then the system has a standardized data schema so that if you're pulling data from Climate Action Data Trust, you don't need to worry about the fact that one registry has one data standard and the other has a different one. Uh, they homogenize that data for you. But there are some issues with CAD Trust. And even though I'm really excited about what they're trying to do, I, I do see some issues with it. And I think IPFS may be able to help resolve some of those issues. 
Um, in particular, um, I think one of the things that, that CAD Trust has done really well is they've developed relationships with registries directly. Um, and this software is all open source. So if you want to fork it, modify it, use it for your own wishes, you can. Um, and it is running on a decentralized network. Unfortunately, the decentralized network it's running on is Chia network, which a lot of people are not super familiar with, especially a lot of um, like less technical people. If you're not involved in blockchain, it's pretty niche. Um, and this has created a lot of overhead for the registries to get set up with this system. Um, so I think that's one of the big downsides, honestly, right now is that Chia is quite complicated to do, uh, to use and run, um, and it's quite uh, niche. Um, so I would like to see them either support multiple backends, um, which would be sort of an open, flexible way to do it, um, or migrate to something that is a little more agnostic, um, like IPFS. The initial schema that they developed is, is a good start, but it does need improvement. Um, they're setting up a user form. It's not really established yet, but I'm looking forward to that getting set up and see how they iterate on that schema over time. Because as new registries and, and credit classes come into existence, there's going to need be a need to evolve that schema. And um, yeah, we'll see how that plays out over time. One of the other issues I've seen is that they're push-based, meaning that the registries have to push their data into the system via a script on the registry side, as opposed to pulling that data. And it's all publicly available, right? Like I run scripts that that scrape this data myself. Um, so there's no reason why you couldn't build a full-based model, um, but CAD Trust went with the push-based model, I think because they want to get the registries more engaged and like building their own tech for this thing. Um, but that was a, a bit of, um, it, was a, it was a bit of a strange choice in my opinion. Uh, and there's no transactional data. It, the CAD Trust only has the registry information, projects and retirements, not like transactions and prices and stuff like that. Um, so this is how we're thinking about using um, registry data right now at KlimaDAO and at CarbonMark. Um, we basically are using a Web2 hosted CMS right now. Um, but what we'd like to do is modify this so that we're using IPFS for the storage. Um, so I've been working with Caitlin on identifying uh, using some of the tooling that's come out of the IPFS space to build a more decentralized data pipeline that um, selects the data from the registries that we want, processes it into a standard format, and then uploads it into IPFS uh, for use by our applications like the Carbon Mark Marketplace that I showed you earlier. And in the end state, what I'd really like is not have to build and maintain my own data pipelines, but rather rely on CAD Trust or a similar um, you know, standardized data 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 format um, that we can then pull in data from a bunch of different registries through CAD Trust and then maybe have some simple post-processing that loads that into a, a storage format that's convenient for us uh, rather than pulling directly from the CAD Trust API. Uh, do, we have some enrichment stuff we do, like we derive um, we derive descriptions, summaries from the underlying data that we think are more accurate. Um, and so we can run those in our own data pipelines based on the CAD Trust data without having to interact directly with the registries, um, which have quite a, a bit of uh, variation in their data standards. That's pretty much it. Um, so I, I, some takeaways from this talk, hopefully it was informative. If you have any questions about carbon markets, I'm happy to chat. Um, but you know, there's this catchphrase beyond just carbon, but that could easily lead us to a credit zoo where all the credits are different and there's no standardization, which creates a lot of confusion and overwhelm for buyers. The EBF is trying to strike a balance at the at the meta level, describing what a credit is and the benefits that it has. Uh, but there's a lot of work to turn EBF from a set of ideas into an actionable, implementable um, framework. Meanwhile, environmental RWAs like carbon credits, they rely on data to derive their value. Without the underlying data being trusted and verifiable, uh, the carbon credits themselves have no value. And that, but that carbon credit data is highly fragmented, and there's a lot of work to do to standardize that and create, uh, yeah, uh, an integrated data data platform for these assets. And so there are some efforts like Climate Action Data Trust going on to do this, um, but there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, I think that there's an opportunity uh, to work with CAD Trust and help them build on more decentralized storage formats uh, and things that are more familiar to the broader, uh, the broader industry than something like Chia Network. Cool. I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, feel free to get in touch.